Well, good morning. Welcome to our morning devotions. Good to see everybody again this morning. And uh, this is episode 91, and we're in Deuteronomy chapter 25. And we're looking at uh, verses uh, 5 through 10 and 13 through 15, which are two separate issues, but I think both important. The long section here is in regards to the kinsman redeemer. And the reason this is so significant is because uh, this is a type of the true redeemer, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what we see here in the kinsman redeemer. And there's principles laid out here um, that uh, we'll note. And uh, what we're going to see here, let me just begin reading in verse 5. Uh, in regards to this one who is going to redeem someone whose name is going to be put out of Israel and all the implications of it. This, this uh, material is born out in Ruth, the book of Ruth, chapter 4, with Boaz and Naomi and Ruth. Naomi, whose husband died, uh, and her two son-in-laws died, the husbands of Ruth and... Uh, and I'm going to forget her name, but the uh, the other uh, daughter-in-law. So when they go back to Bethlehem, there's no men. The only one that goes back to Bethlehem is Ruth and Naomi. And we know that uh, Ruth falls into the field or locates herself in the field of Boaz, which Naomi says is a near kinsman. But that's where, and we'll get at that a little later, but that's what this is in regards to. All of this is a picture of what Christ did for us on the cross. What we're going to see is these four principles. Let me just lay this out here. When it comes to the kinsman redeemers, first of all, he has to be part of the family. He has to be your kin. All right. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is he has to be willing to do the work of a kinsman redeemer because you'll know in Ruth chapter 4 there was a, a kinsman that was nearer to Naomi than Boaz who was unwilling to do the work of the kinsman redeemer and to, to uh, restore the property that belonged to uh, uh, Naomi's husband. And then, for, or thirdly, he had to be able to redeem it. That is, he had to have the money to do it. Uh, that To be a kinsman redeemer meant that it, it was going to cost you sometimes a lot. And most of the commentators say that the near kinsman, the nearer kinsman in Ruth chapter 4 wasn't able to do it because he just wasn't a man of means, I mean, of other options, why he says that he can't do it. That is, he just didn't have the resources to do it. And if he had accessed his resources to buy the property and uh, of Naomi, uh, then he would have been broke. So that's one of the reasons that he doesn't do it of other options that are given. So he had to be part of the family. He has to be willing to do it. He has to be able to do it. And because what he's going to do is he's going to buy the property that belonged to Naomi's husband. And fourthly, he has to be able to pay the full price. The full price. He can't just pay part of it. He's got to have the money in hand to pay it all. All right, totally. So, with that, those are some things that we learn about the kinsman redeemer that we're going to note here in Deuteronomy chapter 25 as an Old Testament type of what Christ did for us in dying on the cross for our sins. He he is our he is he became a man. He's part of the family of. I mean, he is the God Man. So he could die substitutionarily in my place. He was willing to do it. He was able to uh, a ransom us. That is, his shed blood was going to be sufficient. And he was able to pay the full price to completely save us from our sins, to save us to the uttermost. That would be the Christocentric rendering of what we're reading here in Deuteronomy chapter 25. So it says this in verse 5. If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child... So what's happening here is you have a couple of brothers, uh, and they're both married, but one of the brothers dies without having a child. And the question here is, does it have to be a son? And the answer to that is no, it's just the child. The inheritance can go to the daughter. We've seen that in other portions of Scripture. If brethren dwell together, and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. That is, this the home is to stay together is the point. Um, and so she's not to marry anybody outside of the family is the point here. The, the, the widow, all right, that has no children. Her husband's brother, all right, 
shall go in unto her. That is, her brother-in-law is going to marry her, all right, and raise up a child in the name of his brother. This is called a Levite marriage. We see the same thing back in Genesis 38, and in the ancient Near Eastern countries, this was not an uncommon thing to keep a family going, all right? That a name, a family name is not put out entirely, all right? So here you have it. You have a brother who passes away. He, he leaves a widow. He has no heir, all right? The, 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 the brother who passed away or the, the brother-in-law of the widow is to marry the widow and raise up a, a family in his brother's name. That's how this works. Her brother, or her husband's brother, shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife. And I gotta say, this the commentators say one of the other reasons why uh, the nearer kinsman back in Ruth chapter four doesn't uh, take Ruth and Naomi is because of the conflict that would have been in the home by having other women in the home. And uh, that, as I looked at all the commentaries, that was a common theme, which is very practical. But, I mean, it doesn't say it specifically. It just says it's going to mar my inheritance. That's all that the nearer kinsman says. But this is another thing that was considered because you're going to invite these two women, again, into your household and you're going to raise up a child after them um, and, and take her unto him to wife and perform the duty of an husband's brother unto her. All right? He's going to invite her into the home and he's going to raise up a son in his brother's name. And here we go, verse 6. And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother. All right, so the firstborn is going to now be an heir of all the property of the brother. All right, his brother, um, which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. And one of the commentators was so clear, I think it was one of the Reformation era guys, that there's something in us that wants to live forever. It's built into us because we're in the image of God. Um, we don't want to come to an end. The idea of living forever, or, or I, I'm just speaking of without the curse, but it's built into us. And we are going to enjoy this through the shed blood of Jesus Christ as he gives us eternal life and we dwell forever in heaven. But we have a, we have a sense of that that we live with all the time. Nobody enjoys death. I think one of the lies that... Satan is going to say, uh, tell, say and tell uh, mankind during the tribulation is that man can live forever because this is something they yearn for. The way we live forever, so to speak, and it's not directly, is through our children. Uh, to keep the family moving along, children bearing other children, bearing other children, that is family, 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 and that is how we, in our temporal, finite, relative way, experience through the propagation of children a sense of eternality and the bible grasps this here this is an ancient near eastern idea which is being lost upon us right now i think in our culture because uh people are not having kids for different reasons or they're waiting a long time to have kids so by the time their their sons are in high school they're just going to be old men they're just waiting and they're not enjoying the benefit of uh, when the mom and dad are in their youth of raising children, and then and then being a young grandpa and grandma where you can still enjoy your children, and then if you're a young enough grandpa and grandma that you may be young enough to enjoy great-grandchildren, and in seeing each generation, you experience this sense, uh, and, I, and you have to understand, it, uh, of eternality. That is, your bloodline is persisting, is going to persist well beyond your own. Uh, your your own life into a next generation my son my grandsons my great grandsons and i'm going to experience this and then when i go to heaven that even now within this you have that sense of your family persisting nobody thinks about that much anymore because everybody's more interested in how many cars you have in your garage and and self gratification than the fact that if you have no children then your bloodline is going to die with you or if you or I mean, and that's the end. And uh, there's something, there's just something very sad about that when you consider who you are uh, and the idea that you don't really want your bloodline to continue, you see, because the world is so bad as if the world hasn't always been so bad. 
Listen, the world is in a is in terrible shape right now. It is in horrible shape, beloved. But it, it's no more horrible than it's ever been before. It doesn't matter how bad you think it is. There's been times in this world, especially with believers, that have been far worse than this. And but we think our time is the worst time or the most horrible time. And I can cite examples out of history over and over that make the time we're living in like this is like cream, cream and and you know flowing with milk and honey, right? So uh, that's what's going on here. The the sense of the longevity of your fam your brother's family is going to persist because of what you do in in raising a firstborn uh, through your hus uh, your brother's wife widow, and it says this. Uh, he says, because you don't want your name to be put out of Israel, all right? You need the name of your brother to not to be put out of Israel through his family. And if a man like not to take his brother's wife, and here's what happened in, in Ruth chapter 4. If a man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate of the elders. Because essentially what's happening is, is the brother is saying, I don't care what happens to my deceased brother's family. That's essentially what's happening here. And whether his bloodline goes out is uh, no concern to me. All right. So she's going to try to plead a case here, which in this scenario doesn't get anywhere because he's got to be willing to do it. And nobody is forced to do this. All right. This is not something that is forced. It's got to be something that's willing, and which is what makes this a great example of Christ. He was willing to do this and, and to pay the price of his blood that he might redeem us from the marketplace of sin and take us unto, into, unto himself. It says, And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up his brother a name in Israel. He's not going to do the work of the kinsman redeemer. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. He has a duty to this, and he will not do it for whatever reason. All right? Uh, he's not going to do it. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak unto him. And this all happened in Ruth. Remember, they're negotiating things here about how things are all going to work. This all happens among the judges or those that sit in the gate of the city. He says, and the elders of the city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it, that is, if what she says is right, he say, no, I'm not going to perform the work of a kinsman redeemer. And say, I like not to take her. That's not going to happen. For whatever reason, then the elders, uh, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders. It says, loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face. These are all just signs of, 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 of that you, you have failed in your responsibility. You are, con you're just considered the bottom of the barrel. All right. This is sign. This is a sign of shame, absolute shame within the ancient Near Eastern culture, to take off the shoe and then to spit in his face. I mean, even here, to spit in one's face. This is this is like an atrocity. But this is, this is what the widow does to him because she is going to be destitute now because he won't redeem her and her brother's, and his brother's property. All right? His name is going to be put out of Israel is the point. And it says... And, and shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders, loose his shoe from off his foot, spit in his face, and shall answer and say, shall, so shall it be done unto the man that will not build up his brother's house. All right, so it's a shameful thing that you won't take the responsibility of caring for your own family. That's essentially what's going on here. And his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him that hath his shoe loosed. And so I looked that up because to us it doesn't sound much, but basically it means, it means uh, it's, a, it's a form of ridicule. He's going, to have a, uh, he's going to have a testimony of ridicule when you start talking about your personal testimony. This is what this man is going to carry the rest of his life because of his failure to, to help out here. Uh, and it means uh, the miserable fellow, that he is a miserable fellow. That's essentially what it comes down to. That your life is now characterized by the fact that you failed to pick up where your brother left off and provided his name in Israel and be the near kinsman redeemer of his widow so you can raise up a family in your brother's name and now your reputation forever because of this is that you are a miserable fellow that you failed to do your duty in behalf of your brother so um that's what this is in regards to and this is what happened uh, in ruth uh, chapter four 
Uh, remember, it's Naomi. It's Naomi's property. She is the daughter-in-law. Uh, Ruth is the uh, daughter-in-law of Naomi. So the near kinsman has to purchase the property that belonged to Naomi. And with that comes Ruth. And that's what it says. And let me just read this. Because uh, in Ruth chapter 4, it gives us the whole, it lays this all out. Uh, it's, it, it comes right down to it. And I'll just read through it. Uh, and it says, um, uh, it says in verse 6, And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. And I cited some reasons why his inheritance might have been marred. That is, he couldn't afford it, family issues, right? Things of that nature. Um, and after he raises up a son, uh, in the name of his of of uh, Naomi's husband, uh, then his own inheritance may have been divided yet further among more kids. He says, "I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it." And if you look in the Hebrew, I want to check this out. This is all very straightforward. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about this. He says, "This is not going to happen." I've already made up my mind, whatever the repercussions are, I can't afford to do this, I'm not doing it. That's essentially what this is saying. And it says, now, this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing, for to confirm uh, all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and this was a testimony in Israel, which I think is interesting. There's no spitting here, because these things, things deteriorate over time. This is now more or less a contractual thing. And when you read it in Deuteronomy, it's a very personal thing. Uh, I mean, it's a hurtful thing. It's a harmful thing. I mean, you get a, a, a name of reproach. Here, it's like uh, you're not doing it, and it's like I'm not signing the contract, and everybody just goes on with their life, and Boaz understands all that, and uh, and, and now he's just going to work it out, all right? It, things deteriorate over time between Deuteronomy and here during the book of in the Judges when Ruth lived. Um, things, the, the same thing is not practiced. He just takes off his shoe. It's like a formality. Um, Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. That's it. Uh, so all I'm saying is that there's a difference between what had happened in the, initially and what happens here. And... Uh, and it says this, And Boaz said unto the elders, and now here's how it all happens. And Boaz said unto all the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day, because this is a contractual thing. You, you are witnesses this day that I have bought, bought, all that was Elimelech's, all, everything that belonged to Naomi's husband, all right, and all that belonged to Chilion, and Malons of the hand of Naomi, the two boys, all right? Uh, I bought all their stuff too, which is all belonged to Naomi, of the hand of Naomi, all right? So everything that belonged to Ahimelech and the two boys, I have purchased, and Naomi is the widow of, of Ahimelech, Elimelech. Moreover, and then he keeps going, Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, all right, that's how she got into the family, have I purchased to be my wife, part of the kinsman redeemer, to raise up uh, the name of the dead upon his inheritance. That is, I'm going to, I'm going to marry Ruth to raise up a son after the tradition of her husband, all right, which is Malon. Um, to raise up uh, the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of this place. Ye are witnesses this day, and all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that has come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which is speaking of Ruth, uh, which two did build the house of Israel, and do uh, thou worthy, worthily in Ephrata, and be famous in Bethlehem. And there you have it. That's the work of the kinsman redeemer. And all of that is in there to give us an example of what Christ actually did for us when he died on the cross. And one other thing here, and I just wanted to include this at the end because that was enough if I just stopped right there. But if you look into Deuteronomy chapter 25, the end of this talks about honest weights, just weights. It says this, 
Uh, thou shalt, uh, the verse 13, thou shalt not have in thy bag divers weights, a great and a small. Everybody knows a standard weight. God abhors a non-standard weight. God abhors a non-standard measure. That's what we're going to read here. He says, when you have a bag, and these are the weights that you would put on the scale so you could determine what you're buying, because so much that was purchased was purchased according to, to the weight. If you have different weights in your bag, you can cheat people. That's all this is about. All you should have in your bag of weights are standard, the standard weights. That's all you should have. Thou shalt not have in thine house divers measures, great and small. That is, you shouldn't have two kind of yardsticks, two kind of tape measures, two kinds of whatever, whatever uh, uh, liquid measure you have. It should all be standard, the standard. I can't impress that on you enough. God wants a standard. And when we talk about a standard sacred text, the principle is laid out here in just weights and standards. God does not want two competing standards. He, he abhors this. It goes on here. But thou shalt have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. For all that do such things, all that carry ex different kinds of weights, in function by different kind of measures, he says, all they do unrighteously. They are, are an abomination, and an abomination unto the Lord our God. You say to yourself, how important is it that, that what we do, what we distribute is the honest weight, the honest measure, the honest length, that the board is this much, that the thumb is not on the scale when you buy something, that what you're buying is actually the weight of it, right? That that, as that's described to you, that the floor, the floor space is what is described to you, that the acreage is what's described to you, right? All of these things. Uh, this, to God, says, if you don't do this on these very fundamental things which run into every area of life, he says it's an abomination. And so we come, and here's I got my shirt on, standard sacred text, because God abhors something that is not a standard. He, d he abhors it, and, this, and to hold up something that is not a standard and claim that it is, all right, um, is something that he abhors. If you're going to call it the standard, if it's going to be the standard, by all means, and I mean that, by all means, it better be the standard. Or else, God abhors it. So what we're talking about here when it comes to the Bible and other things, which, we'll, which we find in God's Word, which he would say, this is the way I want you to live your life, he says, once I've got that, once you understand what that is, not only the Bible as it exists, but the content of the Bible, once that, once that's established, that this is the way it is, um, and it's very clear, this is the way it is. He says, don't deviate from that. All right, do not do not deviate from that, because I abhor unjust measures. <laughs> And uh, what we're living in right now, we, we call it subjectivism, we call it relativism, right? We call it, we call it an evolutionary model, we call it fluid, we call it things are always in flux, right? And we accept this as normative, and God says, and God says when it comes to, to the way we are to live our lives, we are to live our lives by a standard, by standards that do not deviate and he says, if you do that, that your days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. There is a blessing upon it, and if you don't, there is a curse connected to it. He says, for all that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. This just, if I could just put it in one way, this is like cheating. God hates cheating. God wants things done by a standard. All right. Lord bless you. <laughs> oh man it's very interesting the bible is just full of interesting things the only reason that we don't find any interest in it uh, the only thing i can imagine is we just don't read it because if you read it and if you just read it you, you there's things in here that are that you they just they generate thoughts and and it makes you think about things and and if you don't understand it like we say, Pete and I say, well, there's always Google, and there's friends that can help. I mean, I'd love to help, or I, and I know lots of people that can help. I I know a lot of the pastors that watch this. I mean, they'll help. Now, a lot of, there's a lot of help. Don't say that I'm out here by myself if I have a question. And listen, of all people, 
between my son and, and me and all the schooling we've we've had this whole idea about asking questions i'm afraid to ask questions we blew that off years ago whether or not anybody thought our question was good or bad doesn't matter it does not matter it does not matter they're looking over there saying i wonder why they're asking that they should be asking it just ask questions there's nothing wrong about asking a question do it don't worry about what you think people are thinking don't do anything because you're worried about what people are thinking all right just do what you, you think is best for you as you walk with the Lord. All right. Well, the Lord bless you. You have a great day. And uh, let's see. This is Thursday. One more tomorrow. And uh, the Lord bless you. And just let's continue to remember in prayers uh, the dear folks in our country that are have lost so much. And uh, so uh, just remember them in prayer. And remember, we have the election coming up. Remember that. So the Lord bless you. You have a great day. We'll see you. Bye.